Military moms often need to fill the role of both mother and father to their children. During Hurricane Andrew, Karen Whiting's home was destroyed while her husband was serving overseas. Can you imagine what she was going through? Karen is also no stranger to dealing with trauma. Her 11-year-old son had a headache that lasted for over 11 years. You are going to enjoy the story that Karen is going to share. She is an author of numerous books. She has a great sense of humor. So get ready and we are going to welcome Karen. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. As an award-winning author of 26 books, writing and marketing coach, international speaker, mother of five, Karen Whiting writes to help build tomorrow's wholesome families today. That is one subject that we all need to hear. Welcome, Karen. Oh, thanks for having me on, Carol. I'm looking forward to this. I think that our audience, well, we all have a mother, <laughs> and many of us are mothers, and we always, no matter we, if we are mothers or grandmothers, we love the stories, we love the humor, we share in the pain, we appreciate those who have written, who have helped us, and we know that you are a voice that needs to be heard, and I am so happy to have you. I'd like to start by if you would share how you handled the trauma as a, playing the single role of parent during Hurricane and Well, it was quite a surprise because I knew we had a hurricane coming, but we were actually told our zip code, stay home. We have too many people who have to get out of South Florida and you will not be hit. But prepare because you'll still get some winds. Well, the hurricane <laughs> took a turn during the night and we got a direct hit. So that was quite a surprise, but I still had the children bringing everything in from outside, even putting the canoe on dad's car that was in the garage and <coughs> preparing as much as they could for everything. And then I sent them off to bed, except for my oldest, and we're doing things and I look out the window and the park beside me has these trees as big as oaks. They're gumbo limbo trees. They're uh, mm. also called the tourist tree because the bark turns red and peels. They really? were bending in half. And I thought, oh, no, we are really going to get hit because it hasn't even started yet. So wow. I grabbed everyone, had them bring some mattresses, and we went to my closet that because when we had the house built, the architect never told us. We ended up with a 12 by 12 foot closet, but God knew I would need that. During the night, and I had the children were two to almost 16, I had Daniel was still nursing and he would wake up and everybody would then wake up. So I'd read from the Bible and I would pray because I didn't know what else to do. But I always turned to God. Right. And about five in the morning, I read Jesus calming the storm and I pray for Jesus to calm the storm and everything stopped. And I'm it's silent, no crashing, no wind blowing, nothing. And after a couple minutes, my son, Michael, the oldest son in the back of the closet, pipes up and says, Mom, you should have read that one first. <laughs> we all laughed and I said, you are right. <laughs> but 
We went down and stuck. Well, actually, I went out to see what was happening. Then I grabbed the two oldest, oldest daughter, oldest son, to go down with me and assess the damage and get him to start trying to close the front door. That wind is still blowing it with a piece of wood from the garage and some nails and hammer. He's having trouble fighting the wind while doing it. When a neighbor comes and helps him finish that up. My daughter and I are looking around and I said, oh, there's water everywhere. I said, go up and get your dad's socks. We're going to put, and I grabbed plastic hmm. bags. He said, I said, we're going to put them on all the furniture and we're going to put the bags over it. He's not here, so it doesn't matter if we're using his socks. <laughs> 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 and that actually saved the furniture. I didn't know that the furniture. Really? Was, yes, the water can creep up into the legs of that furniture and turn it blue in places. There's a name for it. And that if you cover that and have that plastic around it, it will keep that from happening. So that was just something God told me to do. God also told me to answer the phone. I said, oh, right. And he said, answer the phone. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said it that way. I'll pick up the phone. And, and so I picked up the phone, and there was a dial tone. So I said, who do I call? And he says, insurance. So I call the insurance. Then I have to, I call a friend who's near where my husband is, and she can get in touch with him because I know if I tried to call him, I wouldn't be able to get through the right way and tell him what was going on and ask her to call my parents and tell them, oh, we're just fine. We have some damage because my mother had just had a stroke. I couldn't let her know how bad things were. <laughs> no I got a couple other calls, including my brother-in-law, my husband's brother. And so I thought, good, both sides of the family know what's going on. And then the phone line went dead. Six calls, I was done. Didn't have a phone for a number of days at that point. You know, we just worked on cleaning up, but there were lots of humorous things we were doing at night. Everybody gathered in my room and slept all over the floor and everywhere. <laughs> I think at that time... We didn't have dad there. They all wanted that assurance that we were okay and they wanted right, to be together. Right. And that was fine. You know, as a mom, you react the way you can. And every time there was anything going on, I did the best I could. I looked at my little son who was two, put uh, little boat shoes on him, gave him a bucket, opened the window of the sunken living room that really was sunk, and showed him how to just start p bailing out the living room. <laughs> oh, so my word. Everyone helped. And we did this for days before my husband got in and showed up. <laughs> so what were you going through emotionally at that time? I mean, obviously you were a take charge kind of mom and you had been down this road before. You you knew what to do. You had to play the double role. But what were you going through emotionally? Was it just part of the, you know, the day by day experience that you were used to? Or were you <laughs> fearful or were you angry or what? I didn't have time to be angry. It was much more moment to moment of just, and every so often, just kind of holding in my breath saying, God, give me strength. And then he would just give me strength and I'd be okay because I thought, I can't crack. The kids are here. They have to know we're going to be okay. Right. And I, the storm is, once the storm was over, I said, okay, we made it through. The storm is over. And I didn't let the younger ones come out till we had picked up a lot of broken glass and things. And then the oldest two went up to get the younger three and Rebecca comes out carrying the two-year-old who looks around and in his best mother imitation at two years old, he says, Rebecca, clean this mess up. That must have been <laughs> hilarious. That would ha Did you up. laugh? Did you laugh? <laughs> we did. We all cracked up because we all heard. He was so loud saying this, just like I would have been. <laughs> so, but we, we needed that humor and the humor kept us going all the time. So would you recommend that then? I know that many people say that they get through trauma of all kinds, but with humor. Maybe elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, I think you need to have that humor. You need to just be able to laugh. And, and every so often, if the kids are busy, I mean, they're getting worn out, you give them something easier to do, or you sit down and have a snack or whatever, or you sit and laugh again about something like, all these things are broken. Stuff fell off the wall, but look at the one thing that stayed up. You know, we would just laugh at that, and it didn't. It wasn't even crooked. You know, <laughs> so you look around for things that are really uh, so funny because you wouldn't expect that to happen. I remember saying, "Well, I had all these paper plates for us to use, and they're gone." And when the doors opened, I bet they just flew out like flying saucers into the Everglades, and we just laughed at the thought of what that must have looked like. <laughs> it was just excellent. Excellent. Yeah, so you, you keep doing that, and that helps you. And at the same time, we'd say, but Dad will be back. Well, 
before the storm came, I had had the girls fill everything they could with water and then just put the glasses back up in the shelves, put everything because I had no other place to put them. Plus, they needed to be in the cabinets. And when he came home, he kept forgetting about it. And he would take out a glass and just tilt it and it would pour on him. And we would all laugh and say, if you'd been here, you would have known there was water in those glasses. What it sounds to me like is you have taught by doing, you have taught your children how to focus, how to focus off the negative onto the positive. Is that correct? I have. And my oldest daughter, who is a mother, she has adopted daughters. She lived in the Keys when Hurricane Irma came a few years ago. And when she went back, her husband was a pastor. And when they were able to get back, uh, she just started helping everyone. And it ended up that UMCOR, the relief organization of their denomination, came and said, can we hire you to be a case manager? And she said, well, I'm just volunteering. And they said, no, no, you know what you're doing. You're not afraid. And so they hired her, and she became the lead case manager for the Florida Keys for Hurricane Irma recovery. And nothing was too big of a challenge for her. It was amazing what she was able to find and fit in place. And that is a perfect example of how you can turn a negative into a positive. Yes. And no matter what has happened. Right. Because of her experience, she was almost 16 when, when Andrew hit us. So when Irma came along, she just faced it with such courage and such a heart to help everyone. Now let's fast forward a little bit to, again, struggles of a mom. And I don't know if you were obviously weren't alone this entire time while your son had that headache, but why in the world would a headache last that long? And what were your concerns and how did you deal with that? We didn't know why. We took him, for starting in Miami, to Miami Children's Hospital. We moved to Maryland. He went to John Hopkins. There were so many doctors that looked at him, so many tests he did. When he later went to college and was down, back in Florida when he was in the Sarasota area, he went to the Bradenton, Sarasota neurology departments. No one could help him. They would give him a little bit of relief. I can remember one year on June 22nd, he had what he called an okay day. It was that bad. And if there was too much noise or light, it would get worse. So his room was like a little cave he could hide away in. And I felt like he lost his teen years, a lot of his childhood. And I would pray because there were times he would say, you know, I wish I could just jump out the window and crack my head against a tree and open it up so the pain could go out. And then I would pray that he wouldn't try suicide and felt there were times that I was on suicide watch uh, just because of this. But, you know, he had a faith and he got to a point when he was 22 and he's at living with my oldest daughter and her husband where he was going to college near them. And my son-in-law was a pastor. He was having a prayer time at his church. And Daniel's there praying for other people, thinking, it's okay, God. This is as good as it gets. I can live with this. I've learned to live with it. And as he prayed for someone else that day at the church, he was healed. And it was a month after my husband died. In fact, that month I said, you know, Lord, my husband's prayers are not in vain. And he was healed. I didn't even realize that you were a widow as well. Yes, so I am. that is another uh, <laughs> thing that you had to live through and with your children and be that strong pillar for them. Anything you want to share along that? I would just say we did what we ch- we chose to do that we said to our children who were living all over and we were in Maryland. I never want you to say you didn't have time to see dad. If you want to come and visit then we will pay for the flights, whatever it takes for you to come. And they came and went for those couple of years to see him in good times and bad times. And in the last month, they really came. And my oldest son was getting medically retired from the Air Force at the time because he got a virus in his heart when he served in Iraq. And because it was the end, his supervisor said just go and stay as long as it takes with your dad so he was there the last two and a half weeks my strongest son Hmm. which wonderful to have him during that time but and he said but what do I do about a round trip ticket I said get one way we'll get you a one way back whenever it's time to go back or you need to go back and he says but it costs more I said I don't care (laughs) I said we want you here this will matter more than a couple extra bucks 
No kidding. It's and that teaches your children too on the importance of relationship, the importance of family. Somebody told me many, many years ago the three best things you can do for your children. And that is example, example, example. <laughs> And I never forgot that because, and this is what I'm thinking as you're sharing, you are the example of what you're, you want your children to see and hopefully they will learn from. But there are many moms that are not either able to do that or know how to do that or feel lost because of what they're going through. What words of encouragement do you have for those moms? I still think you have to take it one day at a time. Lean on God and just say, Lord, I can't do this alone. You have to help me through this. And know that he's going to be there with you to help you through every step of the way. And he will send angels when he wants. I mean, I looked out and I had motorcycles coming in our yard because the fence came down and there was a pool. I could just see them going into that pool. I said, Lord, help us take care of this. And at that time... Two of the people who worked for my husband came over. They just showed up, and they went out there with my oldest sons, and they put the fence back up. I'm out there in the front yard picking up debris, and we had just met somebody new at church and found out they were in these apartments across from us. He showed up, and he just starts picking up all this debris with us, which was wonderful and had ideas of how to get it up faster and where to put it and everything. And, you know, I, I gave him a loaf of bread because before the hurricane came and I went out to the store to get diapers and bread and things, I said to the girls, make bread, make four loaves of wheat bread because I don't know what I'm going to be able to get. So I gave him a loaf of bread and I never saw him again to thank him again. It was just an angel God introduced me to and while my husband was home and then that came, showed up. And how does someone learn resilience? Well, it's through the smaller things. When something little happens, what do you do? You know, the toilet backs up, you can get through that. Something else happens, you get through that. And all of those keep in reinforcing resilience. And you should hopefully learn it as a child because there's always things that go wrong as a child, too. You see what your parents are doing, and you have to know, I'm the parent now. I'm the example. And it's, it's even in the good things. I remember when Michael came in with a fistful of daisies, uh, not daisies, of dandelions. He was choking them. And he says, pretty mommy, pretty flower, and gives them to me. And it was so sweet. And I took them from it. In my mind at that moment, I thought, someday he's going to have a sweetheart. And if I cherish these flowers now, he will give her roses. And that's exactly what happened when he grew up. Perfect example. Thank you for sharing that. As a mom, I was crying. No, it's those moments that are so touching. And thank you for sharing that. Now, you also, throughout the time that you were parenting and living through some of the nightmares and some of the highs and some of the lows that you did live through, you also were there for friends, for family. And I'd like you to share the experience that happened when your cousin's daughter was admitted to ER. Yes. Mary's daughter, Juliet, and her husband and son had come and visit us in January. And just a couple months later, all of a sudden, COVID came. And all of a sudden, her daughter wakes her up screaming in the middle of the night. And Juliet's one of the happiest, most wonderful little girls I know. And her mother goes in and tries to pick her up because she says, I have to go to the bathroom. I'm in pain. And she said it was like holding a jellyfish or something. There was no form. Her her bones weren't working and things. And she calls her husband into the room and they get her into the bathroom. And then she calls 911 because she has a fever. She doesn't know what to do. She thinks this is COVID. And her husband has to stay home because only one can go to the hospital during COVID to be with the child. Plus there was the son even though he was a teenager. And so she's there at the hospital not knowing what to think, what to do, what are they going to say, Wh when can I be with my child, what can I do, when the doctors came out and tell her that we think it's leukemia. And it was. And this is like wow. a week or so before Easter. And that was just so, so scary for her. And she had to stay at the hospital for a number of days before they would let her go and let her husband come in because you couldn't switch every day or every hour or anything. It was like once a week you could switch what parent was there. 
Is there anything you would like to address about COVID and any words of encouragement <laughs> to moms, to families, to anyone? Right. Well, certainly keep in touch. You know, I, I've stayed in touch with family and with Zoom and everything. And because my son and daughter-in-law who live here, and they're only four miles from me, we haven't seen each other as often. Because if I went anywhere or did anything, I'd have to wait two weeks before I could see them. Or if something, if they were put in quarantine, they had to wait two weeks. But we did a lot of Zoom calls and Zoom calls with the family. And that's so good to do. We let the children have their Zoom call and the grandchildren have their Zoom call at different times. I was usually on all of those calls. I wouldn't say I was on all of them uh, because sometimes, you know, kids want to talk to each other without mom there, even if they're adults. But, right, right. And that's fine. You know, I, I love that they're close to each other. They have always supported one another. Now, you've been a writer for a number of years, and we're going to talk about your books in a moment. But what prompted you to write? I'm a mathematician. I never wanted to write a book. And... Yet friends would look at what I was doing and say, you have to write about your children, all the things you've done with them and these, the ways you do faith with them and everything else. And I thought, well, I don't know. It took me hours to write a two-page paper. I can't imagine what it would take to write a book. But I'll go on this retreat. And I went on the retreat and I prayed. And God gave me a vision and said, I don't just want you to write a book. I want you to be a writer. And it was like seeing, uh, first he sees, shows me one thing that looked like a, a big golden ball, but then he's told me it was a seed, and he said to plant it, it will produce much. And in my mind, I could then see like a tree with books all over it, and I thought, "Oh, you want me to be a writer?" Ah! <laughs> and the next morning, that first part of the vision actually was given to me when I turned over my placemat from brace uh, from breakfast. That was what was on the placemat. It's framed and hanging up, and. I just said, okay, Lord, I'll give you five years. I'll do whatever people tell me about writing because I know nothing. And in five years, if I don't even have a little tiny thing published, I'll know I didn't hear you correctly. But within five years, I had five book contracts. <laughs> so I just keep on writing till God says, you're done. I like the tree of books. I think that's a pretty uh, neat picture. Thank well, you. Well, it, it overwhelmed me at the time. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> So tell us about your books, not not necessarily the current one. We'll talk a little bit about that. But also some of the other books you've written, who your audience is, um, maybe one or two of your favorites, whatever you'd like. And how many books have you written? The end of this year, it'll be 30 because I have one that is just releasing and three more coming out this year, plus something for next year already. So, yeah, a lot more than I ever anticipated. <laughs> No kidding, <laughs> my word. <laughs> but, you know, they always say to write it what you know. At the time that God called me to write, I had a puppet TV show that was just launching, and so I started with a puppet book. And that was published by a Concordia Publishing House. And because I had a big puppet ministry, but the little children couldn't join, they just weren't strong enough to hold their arm up with a five pound weight on their hand for five to 15 minutes at a time. And so I had invented these little movable mouth finger puppets made with felt or paper and did a whole book on this and that got published. So that was very precious to do. And then I did some craft books for girls paired with uh, devotional books paired with women in the Bible and went on to just doing some time management because I do have that being a mathematician, good skill on that one. And, uh, another book that I really liked that my husband liked so much, he was so glad he could hold it while he was alive, and that was a historical book of stories of faith and courage from the home front, from the French and Indian War to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Wow. The true daily story of what happened to the women, families, and children on the home front of Amer during American war times. And those stories were so rich in the faith and courage of these women. There were women back in the French and Indian War and the American Revolution who were so feisty. <laughs> it was amazing to find these stories. Just loved that book. So you have a, actually an audience that is quite vast. And well, yes, but they're all still tied into family because, again, okay. that's the families during the home front. The puppetry and all those things are to equip people with families of activities to do with their children. Even the craft books for the girls are to help grow tomorrow's mothers today by equipping them with some skills. 
and letting them read about women in the Bible to understand the virtues that they want to develop. So all of them, in my mind, are always still focused on growing a wholesome family. Give us an example of when you just said about uh, helping them acquire some skills. Well, there's one for the girls in which they weave, uh, do a weaving. And, you know, each one of them, as I said, is paired with a woman. And maybe the easiest one is I have Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I talk about family ties in that one. And they make a macrame belt to wear. So that tie, they have that image as they're making it and to look at afterwards as they put it on to think about how important family ties are and that Mary's tied to her child and to be with him from birth till death and resurrection was a wonderful thing for her to experience and for Jesus to have. And so that's where I encapsulate things, even for a child, a girl, to understand family values while having the fun of crafts and learning about a woman in the Bible. What a wonderful analogy. That's great. And your favorite one, was that the one that you had just mentioned or was there another one? I guess my real favorite one that took me 22 years to get someone to publish it was The Gift of Bread, Recipes from the Home and the Table. I grew up with grandparents two houses from me who owned the town restaurant. Hmm. So I grew up in the restaurant business baking bread at my grandmother's house with my mother, with my grandmother, even a great-grandmother. And so bread was such a big part of my life. And in reading the Bible, I was so drawn to all the passages about bread in the Bible from the Old Testament, even God telling Abraham he'd have to work for his bread and Melchizedek with bread, all the way through to Jesus telling us he's the bread of life. And so it's a devotional cookbook with recipes, plus insights into bread in the Bible, and heartwarming stories around bread, which brings in the family. Oh, <laughs> that's so warm, <laughs> warm and toasty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, the aroma of fresh made bread. Yes. Isn't that yes. Beautiful? Absolutely. I was thinking this morning I need to bake some bread <laughs> without realizing that. See, you were probably telling me that. <laughs> and now you also have a blog, and uh, tell us about that. And are there any other ways that you would like people to connect with you other than getting your books? And of course, we'll have all of those uh, on the website and your blog. And then tell us about your latest. All right. Well, my blog is Family, Faith, and Food. That's a good way to get hold of me. But the other thing is if you go to my website, KarenWhiting.com, you can go to any of my social media. I'm probably most active on Facebook because I also have a Facebook page that goes with my new book and an author page for people who want a little bit of advice about writing books and marketing books. You do address that as well. Do you do it with coaching or with teaching or articles or how? All of the above, okay? Okay. I, I am a certified writing coach and marketing coach, so I do that for people who want to hire me. I write articles on writing, uh, particularly on marketing. I write for the Write Conversation blog once a month on marketing. I also teach at different writers conferences so this year i'm not sure if i'll be at blue ridge i may be at that one in may in june i should be online for the one in, in pennsylvania and the colorado one that's moved to online from may to august i should be at also and then october i'm supposed to be live at the one in florida so those conferences are some of the places where people can meet me i also do things with local writers Perfect. And now tell us about your new book. My new book, Growing a Mother's Heart, Devotions of Faith, Hope, and Love from Mother's Past, Present, and Future. It's such a joy to write that type of book. I have 30 weeks of devotion, six days a week. The first day is actually a prayer from the heart for moms to read and use if they want to post it, if there's any that really hits them. And then there's always a devotion of a mother from the past, even including Kubla Khan's mother. I mean, I went way back on some of the historic moms. A mother from the Bible, three contemporary mothers. And they're not all my stories. There's a lot that are, but there's also stories of friends and 
other people that I know so that you get that sense of what's happening with moms and that across the centuries, we still have similar struggles, similar joys. I think of all the words that could be used to describe you, probably the one that encompasses all of them is the word encourager. Mm -hmm. And I am hearing that as, as you are sharing from the things that you had gone through from the the humor side from the different roles that you have played in your life and for being there to help others and that includes your writing and your speaking so you are an encourager and in the world we are in that's it's no secret that everyone needs an encourager and also one who has lived through pain and trauma and you fill that role as well. So I thank you for being that encourager today and I'd like you to just summarize any words of encouragement or anything else that you would like to add. What comes to mind right now is from an old hymn, a Scottish hymn, to give and give again what God has given me. I have been so blessed in my life that I love blessing other people. And I ask God each morning, you know, I, I say words from Psalm 51.10 that says, Create in me a new heart, renew in me a steadfast spirit. And then I ask God to just put someone in my pathway I can bless that day. And you have blessed us, so... You're fulfilled for the day. Again, I thank you, Karen, for being on Never Ever Give Up Hope. And we will definitely, as we promote this interview, we will have everything and every way that people can contact you and follow you. And it is greatly appreciated. I sincerely appreciate the sense of humor, too. I think that is so essential. So thank you for being on Never Ever Give Up Hope. Thank you, Carol. And I'm so thankful that you have such a great message for women to never give up hope and people in general. Thank you for listening to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.